Thank you very much, Steve. This is a really an honor. And um, something I've enjoyed putting together, I've never given a talk like this before, so I appreciate the, the invitation to uh, speak to this topic. Uh, Sam invited me to talk about my path to entrepreneurship. Um, now, I'm not uh, really a professional entrepreneur. I, as as uh, you could deduce from uh, Steve's introduction, my career was as a university professor. Uh, so I would like to um, maybe approach this from a little different angle, but one that I think might be of, of uh, value to you to, to understand. Um, as a professor, professors are expected to engage in academic research. And there's uh, some uh, elements of academic research that are different than traditional uh, technology-based entrepreneurship. Uh, we're supposed to identify and solve a significant problem that your peers would agree is uh, not, not trivial. It's not like a homework assignment that uh, anybody skilled in the art could sit down and solve. And you are expected to publish your, your results in peer-reviewed journals where your top peers in the world will read it and say, yeah, yeah, I've, I've learned something. That's a significant contribution. And as a result, uh, the focus generally is not on producing products, but maybe new theories, new technologies, and so forth. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, just looking back over my career, uh, discuss uh, a handful of technologies that I've been involved with, um, many of which had a uh, entrepreneurship or a commercialization component. The first one is uh, some software called Movie BYU. Um, when I was a student, uh, I think I was a, a sophomore student, I, I saw a lecture given by Hank Christensen, and uh, this was back in about 1984. He showed this picture. Uh, uh, this was my first exposure to uh, 3D computer graphics. I mean, this was years before video games, uh, uh, you know, 20 years before Pixar. And uh, pictures like this just were not uh, uh, commonplace. And I saw that picture, and, and I just fell in love with what I saw, that computers could create images like this. There's uh, Hank. He became my mentor for my uh, master's degree. He was one of the pioneers in this field of computer graphics, and especially as it is, is applied to engineering applications. Well, Hank had this software that uh, uh, he had developed, and I became his master's student and helped further develop the software. And um, it was called Movie BYU because you could make animations. Now, this wasn't something you saw immediately on your computer screen. This took like, like uh, two days of computer computation and film development, and then you could uh, see this animation. So this was really in the early days of computer graphics. but. Um, Hank received numerous requests for, since this was, this was really the first um, commercially available, well, it wasn't even, it was just sold at cost. Uh, it, was, it was the first software that was available to make 3D computer graphics. Hank had a number of requests from, uh, mainly from university, but from some companies. He sold the uh, source code of Movie BYU for, I think, $15, just enough to cover the cost of the tape and the mailing and so forth. And uh, pretty soon the interest grew so much that he thought, well, maybe we could uh, make a little money to fund the students. And so he raised the price to $200 and to $1,000. Finally, he uh, raised the price to $4,000. Orders kept coming in and uh, eventually had enough money that uh, uh, we were able to start uh, distributing royalties. <laughs> So uh, the university kept like half of it, and the, uh, the, the rest was distributed to professors. And over, uh, over the course of about 15 years, 20 years, there were about 4,000 copies of Movie BYU sold. And it really uh, went a long way to uh, uh, getting computer graphics into the real world. Well, now, entrepreneurship, I, I looked up a definition. Uh, the activity of setting up a business, taking on financial risks in the hope of profit, and is characterized by innovation and risk taking. Well, Movie BYU was certainly innovative. It was the first of its kind. Uh, there wasn't really any risk. There was no financial risk for us professors. We just 
continued our day job as professors and uh, reaped some royalties. So we wouldn't really classify that as entrepreneurship, but uh, we, we did get, get a little royalty money off of it. <clears throat> okay, the next technology I'll talk about is uh, a technology called freeform deformation. And this was something that uh, right after I uh, got my PhD, I came back and taught at BYU and uh, came up with this idea. This was in the early days, again, of computer graphics. But the idea here is you've got a three-dimensional model. Th this picture, by the way, is made with movie BYU. And uh, you enclose this model. So this, this is just intended to say it's just any arbitrary model. You've got a bunch of cubes and spheres. or could be anything in this uh, th three-dimensional mesh. In these little control points, then, you, you imagine that this uh, region, this parallel piped region, is enclosed in some kind of a flexible plastic. You know, like these children's toothing toys where you've got a horsey and the, it, you bend the toy and everything inside bends with it. That's freeform deformation. You move the control points, the plastic bends, and everything inside of it deforms. So this was uh, a simple idea, but bef <laughs> it was really simple. I mean, uh, anybody who studied uh, you know, half, half a semester of computer graphics can understand this, but it was kind of revolutionary because up to that point, th there was no way to freely deform a three-dimensional model. So here was one of our first examples from this paper. Just by moving a few of these control points, you can deform uh, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of uh, triangle vertices. So here's a, a model of a, of a bottle. You put a freeform deformation mesh on it and you, you can deform it. And uh, this, of course, is pretty, uh, pretty useful for modeling. Uh, and, and I was excited enough about it that we filed a patent through BYU, 1986. Uh, you need to file a patent before you publish the paper, before there's a public disclosure. So the paper came out in 86. This was viewed as, I mean, this was in the top computer graphics journal of, uh, in the field, and uh, so it was very highly, uh, highly regarded. It took three years for the patent to issue. Meanwhile, every commercial 3D modeling and animation program uh, implemented freeform deformation. If you, if you Google on FFD, There'll be thousands of pictures like this. That's where I got this one. Here's a very complicated 3D model that somebody manipulated with freeform deformation. You can see it doesn't matter how complicated the model is, the freeform deformation works beautifully on it. Here's an animation I found uh, from somebody's uh, class project in some university showing they implemented freeform deformation and they can manipulate the, the model. <clears throat> okay, so um, the patent issued in 1989, cost about $35,000 for the lawyers. So they, they made out pretty good on it. So I mentioned uh, every major modeling and animation program uses freeform deformation only one company ever paid royalties. Uh, this, was, this was back in the early days of uh, BYU being involved in uh, uh, patents. And it turns out that um, there were just a handful of patents at BYU before 1986, and BYU wasn't in the business of going after patent infringers. So even though uh, you know, there are dozens of companies using this software, <laughs> BYU didn't think it would put the church in good light to uh, uh, play the bad guy and go after the infringers. So we, we missed out a, a chance on that. Uh, another example of a, a technology, this is called ray tracing. And um, uh, the idea here is you've got this mathematical equation of this uh, freeform surface for the teapot and the mirrors. And then by uh, using computations that require you to be able to compute quickly the intersection between a a line in the uh, 3D objects, you, um, you're able to create uh, these really high, high quality, uh, high precision images. Um, well, this, I, I, I bring this in as an example of something uh, I, I thought it was a great technology. We got it published in the top venue, but um, 
didn't see a path to commercialize it. Why not? Well, because there are other algorithms for doing this. Ours was faster than anyone else's, but we just didn't see anybody paying money for this algorithm. If there was a similar uh, algorithm, maybe, maybe it's a little slower, but um, and, and given, the, given the experience with the freeform deformation patent, uh, we were still kind of smarting from that, so we didn't pursue this one. Okay, here's a, uh, another technology, morphine. Uh, we, we worked on this for a number of years. This is, so the, the idea here is you start with two uh, sketches. There's a standing chicken and a pecking chicken. And uh, th then you try to draw a sequence of in-between images that smoothly uh, uh, transforms the one chicken into the other. This is actually an example from Adobe Illustrator back uh, 20 years ago. And you can see the in-betweens don't look very much like a chicken. And we came up with this algorithm that uh, nailed it, really. It, it, without any user interaction, was able to compute these, these other in-betweens that look very chicken-like. And it works on things that, that are different. There's a cow being morphed into a deer. Again, no, no user input whatsoever. Um, two completely dissimilar shapes, and, and still it gets a nice smooth transition between them. We, we then move from polygons to uh, uh, images. And uh, this, this was quite remarkable. It was the very, I mean, morphine had been around for a while before this paper, but uh, every other morphine required the artist to go in and say, well, there's an eye, there's an eye, there's a nose, there's a nose. You had to put in a, uh, you know, maybe 30 anchor points to, uh, to get your morph to look very good. This algorithm was able to uh, perform the morph with, uh, with no user input. So that was, that was kind of cool. We had a lot of fun with it. Uh, people say there's not, not, not a lot of difference between those pictures, so that's kind of cheap. There's my daughter. We did this for her wedding. Just shows her uh, growing up before your very eyes. And these required a, a few anchor points, but not nearly as many as uh, you know, the prevailing things. And um, you know, we, we, we looked at commercializing this, but uh, how would you do it? Would, would it be a standalone program? Would you try to license it to Adobe? And we, we just, uh, I guess we, we, never, we never patented it. <laughs> and we never commercialized it. OK, another, another one we uh, uh, created was, uh, how many of you have uh, used Relative Finder? So this, this was one that we started actually back in 1997. And uh, before we put it online, we had experience at my own stake. It was incredible how how related people were. And, and it was so exciting to see the uh, enthusiasm that something like Relative Finder generated for family history that we decided we'd, we'd put it online. And it's now available on relativefinder.org. And you just log in with Family Search, and you can uh, immediately see how you're related to, to hundreds of uh, famous people. Well, as far as commercializing this, um, uh, we, we didn't feel good about making money off of uh, Family Search. In fact, I think they, they had, a, had an agreement, an end user agreement, that you couldn't uh, make money off of their data. Uh, we did request donations, and over 15 years of requesting donations, I think we brought in about $600 out of, uh, we now have 750,000 users, <laughs> so that's maybe less than a penny a user. So. That wasn't a very, very good commercial success. And we weren't going to pocket the money. This was to pay the student developers. OK, the uh, elevator pitch competition. Do you still do that? Uh, it's called Big Idea Pitch. Big Idea Pitch, OK. Yeah, this was, I, I couldn't remember if it was, it was the 2003-04 uh, academic year. And I think it was in this very room. And uh, that year, my students and I had three technologies that, that we entered into the elevator pitch competition. Uh, one, one was called One Page Genealogy, Tween Maker, and T-Splines. 
So uh, one page genealogy is basically a genealogy chart program. And the idea here is that uh, traditional pedigree charts have kind of a fixed format. And um, you just uh, fill in the names of your ancestors. And uh, if they're missing, that's fine. You, there's, they're just blank spaces there. Uh, the problem with, the, with these uh, fixed form charts is uh, each time you go out a generation, the number of ancestors doubles. So um, consequently, the, the size of the paper would have to double, which means if you had a 15 generation pedigree chart that had every blank available, it would be about the length of a football field. 20 generations would be uh, twice the length of campus. Not, not too practical, but the, uh, the reality of it is most of us, all of us, have big gaps in our family tree. And so the idea of um, one-page genealogy, we, we made an algorithm that identified where those missing spaces are, and, and we, we got rid of the missing spaces and in kind of an aesthetic, easy-to-read manner, we, we uh, scrunched everything together so that you can still follow Who's, uh, whose parents and so forth. And here's, I think, 17 generations uh, on a five-foot poster-sized sheet of paper. So we thought that was kind of cool. And given the uh, explosion of interest in family history, this seemed like it could have some commercial possibility. Well, in fact, uh, we made a chart for Joseph Smith's descendants using the same algorithm, 17 feet long with, uh, I think he had 1,700 descendants, and they all fit nicely on this uh, one poster. Okay, the next technology we entered was Tween Maker. This I had a, a very creative student, uh, Mike Smith, who was a uh, computer science major, but he also had an interest in animation, and he actually took this morphine stuff that we never got around to commercializing, and he used it for. Um, uh, cartoon in betweening. Now, the way cartoons are made is that the artist will create what they call key frames, and then usually the uh, artist in training will be assigned to make the in between images by hand. <coughs> well, Mike, uh, okay, Mike came up. I think this was his very slide for this very room uh, uh, 14 years ago. Uh, showing his uh, business case for tween maker, that he could speed up this process of uh, making these in-betweens. And here's, uh, here's an example, uh, pretty impressive really. He just had those two key frames and then tween maker automatically created this, this animation. So it, it could significantly speed up the process of making um, hand-drawn two-dimensional cartoon movies. Here's another Pretty impressive example, just with two key frames. He made this, uh, made this movie. He's, he was in an animation class, and uh, uh, the term project was to make a hand-drawn <laughs> to make a hand-drawn animation. Well, Mike spent three-fourths of the semester writing this tween maker software. So he, he gave everybody a 12-week uh, head start. And then at the, at the end of the, the final four weeks, he used the tween maker software to actually put together this, uh, this cartoon in uh, you know, three times the speed of, uh, of his classmates. And it looked pretty lifelike. It doesn't look mechanical like, uh, like you think an algorithm would. And so uh, this looked very promising for Mike. We'll have to sit through the credits to see the punchline here.
there. <laughs> okay, so that was Tween Maker. Then uh, the, uh, the third technology that we presented in, in the elevator pitch competition was a technology called T-splines. So this was this is a little more technical, but uh, it, uh, it deals with the CAD industry. Now, in computer-aided design, anytime you've got uh, something with a free-form surface, like an automobile or an airplane, uh, they're traditionally been used with a technology called NURBS, which is a four-sided uh, uh, sheet. Artists will move the control points, and it'll uh, change the shape of this surface. The problem is uh, every NURBS sheet is four-sided, so to do something very complicated, you've got to piece together by hand all of these uh, four-sided sheets. So it's kind of, kind of a pain. Like a, this model of a hand consists of, of seven NURBS pieces, one for each finger, one for the arm, and one for the hand, and, uh, and they don't fit together exactly. There are little gaps in the models, which are really a nuisance. Uh, T-splines, instead of having a grid of, uh, rectangular grid of control points, has a, a more, f um, uh, well, the, the, the grid can terminate, grid lines can terminate, and so you don't have to have complete lines of control points. And this allows, for example, this model to be uh, airtight. And so this, we thought, was kind of a big deal. Here's an example. There's a NURBS model of a head. There's a T-splines model of a head. It has fewer than uh, one-fourth the number of control points. So for the artist, that's, that's a very, uh, uh, very big deal. There's a lot fewer control points to move around. You can see with the NURBS, look at the forehead. You've got so many control points up there that it's really a pain to try to get rid of those wrinkles in the forehead. Whereas with the T-splines, you only have as many control points as you need, and so the head... Uh, it looks, looks a lot uh, smooth. So it's a lot easier to use for designers. All right, so, uh, so we entered these three technologies into uh, the elevator pitch. Um, who do you think of those three was our best, uh, ranked the best in, uh, in the competition? Yeah, Tween Maker, in fact, took first place. First place overall, not just of those three. And what do you think the next best one of those three would be? Teeth plant. And in fact, it took number two of the whole competition. And the third, one page genealogy took number three. It was quite, a, quite an amazing uh, uh, showing for my lab. We took first, second, and third place. I think there were 30 entries all along. I retired after that. I never entered the... Uh, Elevator pitch uh, competition again. Uh, so Tween Maker, uh, Mike actually ran with that uh, and and tried to make a business out of it. Unfortunately, the timing was un was tragic for Mike. This was uh, about eight years after Toy Story had come out, and um, Finding Nemo and Incredibles. And uh, Disney itself was getting out of the hand-drawn cartoon market. So Mike uh, wasn't able to make a, make a go of this, unfortunately. Um, T-splines, uh, I'll, I'll sp spend the rest of the time talking about T-splines. One-page genealogy, uh, we, we tried to sell these charts out of our lab in the Talmadge building, and we did it for about 10 years. And, uh, didn't even break even on it, so that was not a... May, maybe if one of you bright students would have run with it, because I, I know there are chart-making companies available right now that uh, seem to be making a success, but... Uh. All right, so let's, uh, let's then talk about the commercialization of T-splines. <clears throat> so why are T-splines better than the prevailing technology of nerves? Well, fewer control points. The models are watertight. And they're a lot easier to use for the designer. And we, we already saw this, uh, this example of uh, uh, since there's, you have control points only where you need them, like where the high definition is at the nose and the lips and the eyes, that's where you have the control points. Uh, the more control points on the cheeks and the forehead, there's fewer control points. So it's much, much more artist friendly. And here, this is a watertight 
version of the nerves. The nerves, literally, the mathematical model of the nerves has gaps in it. So if you tried to make a simulation of that, it would sink because the simulation would allow water to come in. Here's a um, showing the T-Spline's uh, commercial software. So those are the separate nerves patches. You can merge these nerves patches together into a, a single watertight uh, T-spline model. It's going to zip them together. And there you go. <clears throat> Yeah, here's another example. That, there's, there's that teapot I showed in that one ray tracing image. This model also is water, or is not watertight. It has a, a mathematical leak in it. And so if, if you try to use this as a simulation, it's, uh, it, it doesn't work because the, the T leaks out. With T-splines, uh, we can make this as a single watertight T-spline model. And, uh, with that model, we can continue to manipulate it. And here's an artist taking a, that T-spline model. And, he, and notice there's no gaps there. He, everything just, just deforms uh, continuously. Yeah, we made this for the business plan competition. There's the NURBS model of an uh, insect. And here's the T-splines model. Helps to have, have uh, fun models like that to make a, a, a business presentation. All right, so uh, we, we were very excited. I, I looked at T-splines as probably the best thing I ever invented uh, as, a, as a professor. The thing with, well, I should say this, the thing that had the most uh, um, commercial potential. And uh, and so we considered different ways that we could commercialize. Well, we, we actually did contacts, the, the big CAD companies, they, they weren't interested. They, uh, we, so we decided we, we would show them. <laughs> we, would, we would start our own company and uh, implement it and show them just how good it is. So uh, in 2003, January was when T-Spines was invented. Uh, the paper was submitted, SIGGRAPH's the number one uh, uh, computer graphics uh, venue, uh, presented at SIGGRAPH, and, um, and then we immediately be, we, we decided, how are we going to commercialize this? Well, it takes a lot of manpower to create software from scratch for something like a computer-aided design program. So instead, we decided we're going to piggyback on some existing software and uh, just, just write what's called a plug-in that would extend the capabilities of that software to include T-splines. OK, so uh, we, we're, we're getting this company going. The first thing we need is a CEO. Well, I happen to have a son who was a uh, uh, sophomore in economics at BYU at the time. And as you can see, uh, uh, we had a lifetime of experience together in a lifetime common interest in geometric modeling. And so I asked Matt if he would uh, be the CEO of our company. And I was happy that, uh, that he agreed to. Now, there, you know, there's all kinds of little, uh, little things that uh, you, you don't uh, think of when you're starting off making a company. You need a logo. Well, we, I didn't think of that until we got into it. So here's logos from different companies. Um, so we ran with, uh, with this logo. So we, that, that burned a couple of weeks kind of fiddling around with logos. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, we took second place in the business model competition. And so we entered the BYU business, what do they call it, the business? Uh, yeah, it's the business plan competition. OK, the business plan competition back then. You changed the name now to? Yes, the New Venture Challenge Finals. OK. So this is kind of the New Venture Challenge Finals, I guess, of 2004. And, um, and Matt took second place, tied for second place at, in the BYU competition, and he entered a couple of others. That brought in, that brought in some money and some services to us. Uh, in 2004, we filed the patent. And um, 
Of course, the, the most critical thing next to, to having a, a good technology is you need money. Uh, well, where are you going to get money? I, I was just a professor. I, didn't, I wasn't ready to bankroll this thing. Uh, fortunately, the National Science Foundation had a, um, and they still do have a program for funding small business startups that are based on technologies created at universities. And so from the National Science Foundation, we got a $94,000 grant, which got us going up and running. Uh, the next thing, we had to rent office space. Up until that time, we were just kind of using my lab at BYU. And of course, that wasn't a, appropriate to uh, continue to do that if we're uh, uh, starting a business. So we had to move off campus. So 500 bucks a month for office space. Continued to contact the big CAD companies. Nobody was interested. And, uh, and then we, we uh, decided we're going to have to have a booth in order to to make our big splash. So we, we got a booth at the SIGGRAPH Computer Graphics Conference, the, the, the number one conference in, in the field. Uh, <clears throat> 25, 30,000 people attend this uh, SIGGRAPH con conference every year. And we released our first product, a plug-in for the Maya computer graphics software. So there we are at, uh, at this SIGGRAPH uh, trade show. There's Matt in the middle. and. Uh, Tom Finnegan, our, a key student of mine who uh, uh, joined the company. This thing cost us $7,000. If you figure out the cost of renting the booth space, flying the company out there, $7,000. But we were, we were uh, really excited because we had this product. We, we were sure it was going to revolutionize the industry. We were going to sell hundreds, if not thousands, of copies. And uh, they're 500 bucks each. We we thought we'd be after this, we'd be in great shape. So there's there it is. Doesn't it look nice and professional? It's got its uh, uh, a seed DVD and a nice nicely designed package. And uh, we sold one copy. $500. <laughs> and we'd spent all this money, and it, it was kind of devastating. And uh, this kind of how how we were feeling at that time. Like, when, where, where does this end? <laughs> well, at that point, we, we step back, and uh, SIGGRAPH is uh, focused primarily on the computer graphics industry. And um, at this point, we, we made a realization that we probably should have, uh, should have occurred to us early on. But we, we looked at the size of the industry. Well, the animation software industry had annual sales of about $200 million. The computer-aided design software industry, $8 billion. So like 40 times larger. We decided we were probably going after the wrong industry. So we, we switched and uh, retargeted our, our interests at or our our focus at uh, the CAD industry rather than the animation industry. So in 2006, then we, we had another booth, but we were, we were now focusing on, on CAD. And um, we had applied for a, uh, a follow-on uh, SBIR grant from the NSF. And at SIGGRAPH, at, at this conference, we received the wonderful news that they had granted us a half million dollars to uh, pursue the commercialization of T-splines. That was a lifesaver. That hadn't come through, uh, it, it would have evaporated, I'm sure. <clears throat> but one thing they said uh, to us was, uh, Matt, you, you have zero experience running a company. Uh, we're not going to entrust you with $500,000 unless you get a, a really good board of directors. And we were very fortunate to get uh, some extremely uh, high, high profile uh, men to be our board of directors. Bob McNeil is the president and owner of, uh, of uh, the Rhino software company that we were a plug-in for. Keith was a former CEO of a, of a, a CAD company. These other men had had, had years and years of uh, experience either in, in sales or different uh, aspects of the CAD industry. We were very fortunate. How much do you think we paid these guys? Just uh, we, we paid for them 
to come to Provo once a year and we gave them a very small percentage of ownership in the company. They were very, very generous with, with their time, very, very helpful, very, very um, uh, kind in wanting to help us proceed with, without bankrupting us. Okay, I'll pass that one up. Okay, so, so things started humming after this. 2007, it, it wasn't big uh, increase, but we finally re released this, this first plug-in for the CAD industry. Uh, the fir first month in December, we had nine sales. Not, not big, but more than one. And, uh, but we, we sold 50 licenses to resellers. Now, the way resellers work in CAD software is you sell it to the reseller for half price, and then they basically get 100% markup. So it's, it's a win for them. But uh, the deal is they had to buy like five at a time. So that, that kind of gave us an influx of cash that we, that we really needed. There's Matt at this time. Uh, he seems a little happier than he did after that uh, first disastrous year. And uh, Matt graduated in 2007. Up until that point, he'd, he'd just been part-time. <laughs> He was a full-time student and a part-time CEO. Now he graduated and uh, became our full-time CEO. Okay, from uh, 2008 to 2010, um, it was kind of slow but steady growth. We were burning $40,000 a, a month in uh, salary and office rental and uh, uh, other expenses. So that's a little scary, $40,000 a month. We, had, we did have a $500 million, um, or $500,000 grant from National Science Foundation, but that doesn't take a lot of months to uh, spend that at $40,000 a month. We fortunately had a few other, had four other grants, and it uh, seemed like every other month, Matt would come to me and say, sorry, Dad, we're a little short for payroll. Uh, could you dip into your retirement savings again and uh, uh, help us out? So. So things got a little dicey there. The, the retirement savings was draining uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but we, we were making inroads. I mean, it, I was encouraged enough that uh, I, I thought we, we, we had a good chance of success. We had a lot of high profile companies that were um, users of, of the uh, T-Spines technology. And uh, yeah, we had several target industries. Consumer products. I mean, initially for CAD, I thought is, with my engineering background, well, it's going to be mainly car design and uh, you know things with uh, with serious mechanical design applications. But uh, jewelry, I had no idea that uh, jewelers were, were using CAD. Toys, furniture, um, biomedical, and uh, we had users in all of those. Application. Here's some of the models that they came up. They're just really uh, incredibly uh, professional-looking models. <clears throat> There's some uh, free-form architecture. Um, we had a, a company called Zaha Hadid, which was a big, uh, you know, very, very big name in uh, architecture. That really pioneered the use of CAD for making making these free-form architecture designs and and they were they were big users and uh, promoters of t-spines that that helped watercraft jewelry look look at the uh, intricacy of some of these jewelry designs that were that were designed with t-spines okay now um, I don't didn't pick up too much on the uh, entrepreneurship aspects of this. Uh, there is this book called Crossing the Chasm that suggests that uh, uh, whenever you have a startup like, of this nature, there are a bunch of, be, be a lot of early adopters that are excited to try new things and they're willing to take a risk and they don't care if the software is a little buggy or if it's missing some features. They, they just enjoy the thrill of being uh, some of the first to try things out. And we had a number of very, uh, um, vocal early adopters that uh, tried it out and liked it and they went on the forum and said good things about it and wrote nice testimonials uh, but that won't sustain the company and uh, what, what often will happen is you'll have a little dip the early adopters die out and what you really need to do is somehow get a foothold into this uh, mainstream of users 
And that's kind of where we were in, in 20, uh, 2008. Um, this, this was a pivotal, uh, at least from my vantage point, this, this was a pivotal uh, uh, testimonial for me. This uh, Sky Greenewalt was a, um, uh, a CAD model, or he'd been uh, using CAD, he'd been using NURBS for uh, uh, quite a while, designing aircraft. And um, he made this aircraft using T-splines. And you can see uh, it, it has a lot, of, a lot of huge advantages over the NURBS. I won't go into the tech, technological parts of it here. But then he wrote this testimonial. He said, um, that we got a lot of mileage out of. While NURBS provides the underlying math for nearly all surface modeling software, NURBS has inherent limitations. The workflow can feel like one is stumbling around in the dark. Designers have, had, uh, have just had to accept these limitations. I can model at least 75% faster with T-splines than with NURBS. Now that's, uh, that's something that can get people to buy your product. I mean, if, if, if you're maybe 10% faster, it's a little harder sell to get somebody to, to change their whole workflow, to invest in the software, and uh, take a chance on a, on a new startup company. They're not sure if it's going to be here tomorrow. But uh, when, you, when you have seasoned uh, uh, customers saying that, that they're saving 75% of their time, that's, uh, that, that gets, gets people's attention. For the designer, the truly revolutionary aspect of T-splines is that it allows the creation of large, complex surfaces, which are one single unified element. T-splines are 100% forward and backward compatible with NURBS surface. So a T-spline surface can be manufactured on all standard machines. And then the, the clincher, I can say without a doubt, I will never ever make another airplane in standard NURBS again. With T-splines making edits to the models is so easy and wonderful. Wow, we got that testimonial, and uh, I was ready to dump my whole retirement savings into the company because uh, you know, it, it was clear that the software had matured, the technology was everything we had, we had dreamt of, and, uh, um, and so we moved forward. So, so here's where we were. 2004, we had this complete failure. The thing only sold one copy. Uh, then by 2007, we, had, we shifted over to the CAD industry and uh, had this T-Splines for Rhino that really proved the concept, got some great testimonials out of it. And uh, at that point, we started looking at other, Rhino's uh, kind of a, a low-cost uh, design software. Uh, the big boys were like a company called SolidWorks and Autodesk. Well, we, we, um, we made a plug-in for SolidWorks that, um, uh, got a lot of traction at, at their annual vendor show in January of 2011. A lot, lot of people were excited about it for uh, that the T-Spines was going to be integrated into uh, SolidWorks. And uh, this uh, was what we called the MVP. Does anyone know what MVP stands for in this context? Most or minimal viable product which means you've got the bare minimum number of features in it that anyone would pay any money for at all. So just kind of really uh, enough to see if anybody was interested at all in uh, the T-splines. And sure enough, it got a lot of good uh, publicity. Well, that was enough. Remember, I told you seven years earlier, we'd approached Autodesk, the, the, the number one company. They had no interest in uh, T-splines. Oh, okay. Well, time got away from me. They came out and uh, wanted to buy the company. So I'll close with this puzzle. What do you sell a company for? Well, the, um, here's a data point. Autodesk had acquired a company called Alias for $197 million. It was 23 years old. They had $83 million of revenue, 600 employees. We were seven years old. We had less than a million dollars revenue and seven employees. How on earth do you decide uh, what to sell for? And I won't answer that question, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was challenging to, to come up with a figure. But we sold, we're happy, and that's the end of the story.